openness and, and transparency. And, and, and we took that with us as America to every country <coughs> we went as a model for how politicians are supposed to function. And for him to do that, it just pissed me off so much. I just, bam, I did a whole bunch of stuff and then I edited it out. And, you said it well. Yeah. yeah, thanks. So I'll do it again, but um, they only stay up for about a week and then I pull them down, to be honest with you, because... My home gun. Uh, I'm a little concerned about um, uh, it, the lack of privacy. <laughs> um, there isn't any privacy. So Dave, the, the, fact, <laughs> the fact that you posted it, they can already take a screenshot the second it's up. It's already up forever. All right. Did did you see what? On oh, the I heard about the Tillerson thing. So no, I didn't read oh, your okay. stuff. Yes. But I, I don't know how to get it out there to a big enough audience. I just <clears throat> made some curious announcement that <clears throat> if you use the word document or any form of word, it's already tagged to appear before it on front of a CIA document in Washington or Virginia. They're interconnected. Any word document you use and somehow oh. goes filters back into a central CIA. So everything is known. Yeah. I did a search the other day because I was worried about that. I read I, about I was pleased to I pleased I was pleased to hear that. I always I every <laughs> once in a while yeah, somebody good for you. They You're not a coward the, like me. <laughs> what is it? The, they yes. had the, when they listened to the phone, they yeah. said they would listen to the phone. Yeah, keywords, they'd auto start recording so I would, you. I would just every once in a while when I was talking, I'd say, well, if anybody's listening to this, I hope they're, they have a mind so that they can gain some great insight into the conversation I'm having. <laughs> God, this is ridiculous. Nah. And now I make comments on the news articles. And sometimes I get up and I don't remember what I wrote and I get these comments back like, I don't understand what she's saying. And I read it and I say, yeah, I wouldn't understand it either. <laughs> I didn't understand it. So I rewrite it so and I correct it. Understanding is a luxury that few of us can indulge in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I rewrite it and I say, correction. And then one guy said, well, this is a first. Somebody admits they're wrong. How'd you have Something like that. There you go, Dave. So my brother showed me a pretty good meme the other day. It said, it was Trump's wine. Is Trump said, Obama tapped my phone. And then it has Obama sitting back laughing. I tapped everybody's phone. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> what do you think, you're special? Obama was no saint. That's for well, damn sure. Bush started it, but I'm, presidents don't give that stuff up once they have it. They don't hand it back. Oh. It's so funny. And some of the comments are very insightful when I read the different news articles. And I read, I can't comment on all of them, but some of them have some really interesting insights. Wow. It's un, just, un, and then there's those that just religiously, why don't you just give Trump a trash chance? <laughs> <laughs> and everybody said, how much chance do you want? <laughs> Kept it. Well. It's amazing that the, the the split in information, though. That's the thing. I mean, my my parents, my dad and stepmom, watch Fox all day long, and I said, "But the guy lies. He has this long list of straight, flat-out lies. Or what do you or what do you want to call it? Bullshitting, right? But it's lies or bullshitting or something." And my dad says. What I, I haven't heard that. What are you talking about? <clears throat> the guy sits and watches news news all day, so the stream of information that he's getting is so very different that it's not even part of his reality that this guy is such a sociopathic liar. Well, so I'm how can you talk to someone whose reality is based on an information flow that is so diametrically opposed to your own? I like what you, you said, Pierre, show, which is, hey, you're actually if a man does not what know, but believes you to hear. that what he <laughs> right. knows... That's program, buddy. If you do no, CBS, if man, you have Ted Turner. If a man does you not know, kid, right? but believes <laughs> that he thinks he... or believes that he knows, <laughs> but believes that what he knows <coughs> is true, the implications are... 
<coughs> that there is, he cannot recognize or distinguish what's true or not true, and therefore he will be uh, resting on falsehoods. I think that's how you put it. Well. So I take those and I paraphrase them through all the comments right. and send them around the country from Baltimore to yeah. California. So what do you got there? Well, it's a uh, uh, the difference between the classical world and the modern world is epitomized by Trump. Really? Yeah. Right. He is. Unfortunately. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Like uh, Academy of War. Yeah, bits and pieces. Uh, uh, could you tell me why in the myth of Prometheus, Epimetheus then opens up Pandora's box and why that relates to the whole of the story of the myth of Prometheus? Um, Do it again. Certainly Prometheus brings great gifts, including, by the way, dreams and understanding of the arts. Why does the myth include his brother Epimetheus? And then why is there discussion about him opening the Pandora's box? Why is that related one to the other and how does it apply today? Jesus. Um, Good well, the, the underpinning is Prometheus is providential and Epimetheus is hindsight. Mm -hmm. um, that's what basically what the, the words could be translated as. Um, so Prometheus knows that there's a box that shouldn't be opened. Epimetheus hears that there's a box that shouldn't be opened and opens it anyway. Well, it was actually Pandora, but through yeah. Epimetheus's in, inadequate management uh, of it. What springs forth from the box? Uh, all the plagues that occur to mankind. Hope. And hope, right? Hope, hope. is left. <clears throat> That's the one that you what marks you. What marks all of the Trumpian people is hope. Is hope. That's right, it's hope. And the question is, how does he fulfill the idea of hope? See, you first have to have someone who you can believe in. He has to create an image of believability, right. right? That means he has to be able to make statements that are in principle nothing but promises and promises for the future, yep. right? That stirs in the person either revulsion or hope. Mm -hmm. right? In every case, when it awakens hope, they have no interest in looking at the person's past. Nope. It has nothing to do with their interest. They can ignore this, his lying tradition, his criminal behavior, his associates, because he's awakened hope in them. Right. And hey, that's what's common. Yeah, but you see, the, the highest hope you can have is what Tertullian said most beautifully, is that you have to, you can't believe the believer. Belief always presupposes some degree of evidence, always lacking, but nonetheless some element of evidence. Right. There's no possible evidence that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, or that his mother was a virgin. So Tertullian said, faith, faith because it is an impossible belief. Therefore a new term comes into existence, faith. Therefore it awakens people with hope. He has to he has to present himself or people have to present him in such a way that he only has one aspect which is important believability. Right. Right. There can't be any evidence to support it. 
because it's based on a faith. It's hope and faith. That's the return of Prometheus's legend of awakening hope, because there's nothing more disastrous to mankind than hope. Because when a hope is awakened, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to participate in it. You don't have to go along with it and cultivate things in view of that. Paralyzing. You, because someone is going to do it for you. That's hope. Right? Trump will do it all for you. He's believable. Right? Therefore, recently, when, when he addressed all of the Republicans on health care, I love the remarks they made when they left that meeting. They said, he's really believable. Yeah, he is. <laughs> all of them. They all said that. That's right. But they, but, but they didn't go with him. No. Right? 20 said no. But they could see that he was making his big pitch. What? You know what a salesman is? A salesman is someone who thrives on hope. He has to appear believable. The pitch he's making has to be accepted independent of the evidence, and you don't look at the competition's analysis of your product versus theirs. Right. Right? You are to bring about hope in the people you're talking to. Then you can make your sale. Mm -hmm. right? what, yep. Who's the other gospel of, the, of hope? How to win friends. And influence people. Yes. Oh. Uh, Same thing. So that's what he said. Never Carnegie. disagree with someone. Appear that you're all the all with the person, right? He he gave the laws of how to be a, a sophist, how to be a. And our country works on salesmen. That's right. You have to believe in your product. Mm -hmm. If I don't want someone working for me that doesn't believe in their product, they have to go out there convinced. Therefore, we have to have inspired speakers to come in and motivate our salesmen to go out and convince people of the value of their product, hope. Right. And that's behind Sounds like all a, of the comments. like a politician to me. Yes, yeah, yeah. With, with that, with that um, principle or philosophy, it, it, would even, it would even take away from the believability if you were to supply evidence. That, that, that's the point. No one cares about evidence for or against it. He's believable, therefore you put all your hope that he will fulfill his promise, independent of his background, independent right. of right. every, yeah, especially. I'm saying uh, if he did bring some evidence, it would actually make him less believable. That's right, that's right. Because it's like, if you try to prove that you uh, are saying something good, then you become less believable because you look less certain. Yeah, because now you're now you're being reasonable. <laughs> it's like the lion tamer or the beast chainer in the Republic, who appears to have control over the beast because he's studied the beast so well, he knows what the beast expects mm -hmm. and therefore can 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 function to appear like he's in control when actually oh. uh, all he's doing is really doing what the beast wants to do oh. anyway. Oh. And once they figure that out, then they can oh. continue by transferring it. We're the beast, and our and our and our passions are hopes. And uh, if they can figure out what our hopes are and keep those going, oh. then then they become believable. Well, the, the strongest loyalists to Trump are white Christians. Yep. Yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> but they, they're, they're, they are all based on hope. That's their background. That's true. So therefore, he's coming in to appear like the very figure they need when they go to church. He's Jesus to them. The minister has to pre present himself as a figure of believability and will promise, right, they're going to promise the kingdom of heaven. Okay. All you have to do is believe. Hey, that's pretty good. You know, nothing else? I think I'm going to join that group. 
you're off the hook. I'd rather be reborn than end up in heaven. If I have a choice. If I if I've only given those two choices. Yeah. You can go to a Christian heaven or you can be reborn and try again. I take rebirth any time. Well <laughs> I'm trying to start. It's not you take sorry, the it's right. You're going to go up into heaven and you're going to hang out with the gods and you're going to think so highly of yourself that you're going to do awful things when you come back. <laughs> it's got to be better than living in blissful ignorance. Well, But how much do you think Trump really, I mean, like he's a, tr he's a salesman that even sells himself. Hey, Dad. I'm thinking that Bannon is behind a lot of his... Bad things. Bannon, the guy who is the um, yeah. Yeah. KKK yeah. guy. And when I hear him talk or very, very quietly, he's worse than Karl Rove. But well. he doesn't come out. He's very secretive. You really have to go on the internet and, and, and quotes by Steve Bannon and do about ten of those sites and you're going to see a picture of a guy that is absolutely a communist. Absolutely um, a, a... Lenin. A, well, yeah, a Leninist. Uh, an oligarchic tyrant. Oligarchic? Hmm. Yeah. Um, well, that's he, he, well, because he can't do what he proposes to do alone. It would have to be a, a, a concerted effort by a very skilled group of people. And so he says that things like, we can only make this work, well, our current revolution, by making the people so tired of resisting yeah. that, that we'll be able to carry on our agenda beyond so that's what's going on this first hundred days. I don't even think the health care bill was real. I think the health care bill was just a, a set up at the exact time when he was nominating his Supreme Court Justice. All that news that we would have been watching 100% about Gorsuch and, and what he is has been obscured. Um, uh, the Trump policy in Asia has been obscured. Uh, they, they put out these shiny objects, and I really do think they're smart <laughs> enough to um, distract us from the real underlying agenda. And those bills and, he passed? And if you look at Steve Bannon, you, right. and, and 10 pages of his quotes, uh, you're going to see a, a picture of where we're headed. And those bills he passed two days ago, right, to heal up, corporations now can dump poisons into rivers and streams. And yeah. And all that of, didn't even make the news because we it was all about health care. Gorsuch and Yeah, the, the XL healthcare. pipeline. In Russia, so, yeah. XL pipeline is a pipeline from Canada to seaport towns that have oil refineries in them, and that oil is all going overseas. Nobody in America is going to benefit from the XL pipeline. Nope. Yeah, except for um, some some large oil corporate. Oh, but there's hope. There's jobs in there. You know they say tens of thousands. You know how many jobs are going to be? Twenty. <laughs> no. Um, 3,000 jobs, or if it takes one year, a little over 3,000 jobs. And, a and if it takes to less, in two years, it'll be about 1,900 jobs. So, um, for two years. And um, there are no jobs going into this project. Yet, I've heard right wing commentators say, well, the th tens of thousands of jobs that this is going to generate. No, it's for two years. And then it, it'll take, a, 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 um, I think it's 159 men, 159 workers will then maintain the whole pipeline for the rest of its duration. See. <clears throat> 159 permanent See, jobs. Like, how is that different than uh, the reports again and again of the terrible crimes that nuns and Catholic priests have committed? Uh, no they, un different. They, they open up se uh, septic tanks and discover four or five hundred uh, fetuses, fetus, young, babies, young babies, year old, less than year old. Yeah, there was one in It doesn't, see, 
No one can do an accurate history of the Catholic Church and not be repulsed. Mm -hmm. But it will never change because they have hope. That's right. And they believe right? they'll be saved because of it. Faith, faith is hope. And they'll be saved because of it. So the psychology of hope allows all tyrannies of all kinds to perpetuate themselves. Julie, we need to read the look at that hope scale Gottschalk did. Oh, yeah? Yeah. No. He did a hope scale. So that, like, what is, what's the difference if we taught people in our schools these myths? And, you know, right from the beginning, hey, this is Prometheus myth. Let's take a look at the origin of hope and how it's connected with all kinds of disasters. Interesting. Well, we don't teach people. Pandora? Pandora or Prometheus? Pandora's box? Pandora's box is yeah. hope. It was, well, so, Pierre, when I was in... So what would it be I like to live in that age where that's being discussed around tables? Your chance of having a trump is lessened. Theo. Yes, yes. If we had if, all that if, education... If there was adequate re reflection on the very nature that's of hope, what it is trying to maintain, and why it has such a grip. Right. And that gets into a, a different hmm. kind of question. What is hope hmm. trying to maintain? Is, hmm. is it based on the belief system in which you find it? No. But, but it seems like there are many different antagonistic belief systems that all have this bind, this bond of hope. There's a, I noticed this morning on Yahoo News there's a, I didn't read it, it's an announcement. They're doing a nice study of the evangelical ministers and the fortunes they've accumulated. Oh. Okay. And therefore they're saying, what is going on? What is this? I thought Christian had something to do with raising the level of ignorance and wiping out the problem of sin. No, no, it's accumulation of vast empires by the ministers. That's a Catholic Church. That's Catholic Church. See, that's something you left out of your article. That would have been nice. You're the bond of belief. Yeah. The bond. bond. I mean, there's a bond of oh, problem of hope. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that'd be a great article. Wonderful. Go for it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm. I'm, need to bring that I'm up. I'll wait for that one. Well, I got two under. I have two coming up. No, no, it's not. That's I saw the hand go up. Did no, you? No, that's yeah. stretching. That's your teacher. That's the teacher response. Yeah. No, no, it wasn't a question. Okay. I... <coughs> what are the two? What are, besides the one? Is three now? Hope <coughs> and the other two? Or is yeah. Hope one of them? I wanted to say that. I think you should Because you said Well, there you was had supposed two to be five and one more. Now he's saying that there's five rotation. and two more. So you don't have to. Well, only once a month. Well, but it might help. Four. Maybe we should think of another time. I've made six. 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 Oh, you know. But I think hope would be a great. Well, here's I'm hoping that that will be available soon. <laughs> because uh, I like the last one. Could hope be a part of philosophy? Could it could it have the same power in in continuing to pursue this, or is there a greater conviction than hope that allows for a more complete working out of a set of beliefs? Mm. Well, there's the art of, of love, isn't there, that allows for prophecy and divination and other such things that are far removed from hope, more accurate one would hope. Well, you just tossed that out as if it was a foregone conclusion. Yeah. That, well, that, no, I gave a little reasoning. I gave a little reasoning. No, I, I, think, charity no, I, think, I think you made a, a, a marvelous contribution. Love might be a bond that would keep something moving forward. Or bring it to uh, but, wisdom. So, <clears throat> A love is a myth. Yeah, well, what even, kind of love? The love of the love of the symposium. <coughs> a love is a myth. How so? <coughs> What's the myth? I'm glad to hear that. Finally. It's, it's in, <laughs> it is, you hoped you'd hear it earlier. In principle, it's incomplete. How would that make it a myth in itself? But I'd like to know in what way does, is it incomplete? Oh, it, without understanding, there's no hope that it will ever turn out to the advantage of either the beloved or the lover. 
But what about love with understanding? Well, then it's different, see? Then you don't need hope. By itself. Does it need a different name? No, see, by itself, we it's incomplete. It. Love is standing. <laughs> so by itself, it's incomplete. Interesting. Incomplete. I still don't understand. Um, because you could love something without understanding it would mean you'd love something less than you're getting. <laughs> and doing. And doing. And expecting. Hmm. Hmm. Is, is it so then it sounds like hope. Is that what you're saying? That was, uh, that, <laughs> it's getting it's close. Hope. Is, is that because you don't understand what it is you love? Because you don't understand the object of your love? That's right. That makes sense. Uh, <laughs> love, love is only an attraction for what is considered beautiful and good. Mm -hmm. it, it's a desire for what one lacks, necessarily. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. But in itself it is incomplete. It's essentially it's blind. It lacks understanding because of the perception of what one <clears throat> lacks. The perception right. itself of what one lacks is incorrect. Yeah, like right. um, picture um, everybody has to create now an idea, ideal image of an object of love, right? <laughs> Male or female, whatever you want, right? Got it? Work on it? Right? Do it better. Add to it. Make it more perfect. Yeah, By the way, uh, did you include in that image understanding? No. Not there the first time. Therefore? It requires it. Why? Because without understanding, there's no real union. No. Hmm. Of, of, of what? There can be a bond with love, but not a union. I found a little experience in this. Uh, <laughs> Speak on. Speak for. Speak on, and, uh, James Bond. As I look back, maybe through this conversation, maybe through recent reflections, I see that what I loved, a necessary part of it would be that it would be exactly what I believed to be true at the time, without having to change my view of what love was. Mm -hmm. it, that love was the fulfillment of my own beliefs about what I was doing, and that there was no... It was, it was the fulfillment of my path of love. I, I'll Therefore, no understanding. No understanding. No understanding. And, and, and no success. Yeah. Yeah. And then, very and then, quickly. <laughs> and therefore, you know, every story ends up with the same underlining theme. Let's see. Uh, here it was. I got this person who I really love. And I woke up one morning and I realized... I was robbed! I don't know whether uh, that person uh, is what I thought they are, or how am I going to deal with that person if it turns out that they don't understand me, and likely will never be able to understand me, but I love them. Chaos. All you got left is hope. Hope they'll change. So, <laughs> to meet your Matt, to meet your, your uh, Pavologos. That's when you jump in the car and go to church. <laughs> that's, that's true. Right. That's right. I went to church and prayed for say. change. I find something that they can be a, great, a part of a greater whole. So the only sufficient love then is philosophos. Sufficient? It's philosophy, yeah? So, yeah. Or are... Why in the symposium uh, does Diotima start off with, hey Socrates, if you don't understand just one thing, uh, when something lacks love, does that mean it's ugly? Oh yes, that's true. She says, oh, then you think op opposites follow, the lack of this and that? Oh yes. You mean you think there's no difference between and nothing between wisdom and ignorance? 
Why does she then not now introduce the cognitive functions of wisdom, right? Understanding, right opinion, ignorance. Why is that central to Socrates' thesis about the nature of love? That's what starts it off. And the end of the myth of poverty and plenty ends up explaining that whole myth is to serve only two purposes. Understanding the nature of wisdom and ignorance. And what's in between is love. And understanding is in there. Well, see, the reason why only those two are needed is because when she explores the idea of these four functions, she only describes the way in which the middle two function understanding and right opinion. She says, hey, you know, uh, understanding without, 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 you know, without, without having to have... Being able to give a true account? Give a true account. That's understanding. Yeah. And right opinion is when you, 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 you're right, but you don't understand the reasons why it's right. Therefore, what's left over, well, okay, what's going to be knowledge or wisdom and what's going to become ignorance? In order to fulfill that, he has to generate the myth of poverty and plenty. And that's why in the pursuit of love, the, the key step is knowledge. Hmm. I neither understand what, why, what would make it the key step, nor do I understand what it would be knowledge of at this point. Because we're talking uh, love of wisdom, right? That's what Jeff introduced. So, is it cold, you guys? Do we know you wisdom? No, right? Do we know the beloved in the progression, mm -hmm. right? Which is or how much are we willing to know the beloved? Well, the beloved drops out pretty soon. <laughs> the sequence doesn't well, because the you go to hmm? the object of the love. It, 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 it doesn't drop away. The, the object of love is wisdom. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That. Well, See, as he goes up the steps, yes. right, it proceeds into different kinds of knowledge. Yes. Right, and suddenly we see a knowledge vast, etc. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you will behold mm -hmm. the great ocean of beauty beyond it. So at the um, beginning, if you're not trying to know truly and understand really what the object of your love is, then the process is stopped there. That's right. So, so, uh, so uh, a relationship is an invitation to philosophy mm -hmm. and to seeking deeply within yourself and the other person. Yeah, the key, uh, the key into knowing people. is when the transition is the object, then you have to see the, the customs of your people, see the beauty and the customs of your people, that's mm. a step into knowing as it proceeds up, then knowing different kinds of knowledge. Ooh. Well, seeing the beauty and the customs of your people would be nothing less than midwifery. Yeah, there we are. <laughs> <laughs> because there aren't too many great customs. Yeah. Seems like we could easily weave in two other dialogues. Phaedrus being one, where you where you love the the image of the God, I'm gonna call it an mm -hmm. image of the God, in your beloved that you followed after mm -hmm. in your last uh, journey outside the body, right? Mm -hmm. And you try to make both yourself and the other like that divine. Mm -hmm. That would seem like it might involve the understanding that we were talking about. That's right. That's right. And the other dialogue is? 
just lost it. Oh, oh, darn, darn it! Oh no! The one we were working on last night, the Timaeus. I, oh. I also kind of wandered in with the question of, like, that ultimate state of the symposium. Would that be the circle of the same coming to knowledge, the highest knowledge? Because we talked about <coughs> the circle of the same comes to right at 37. I didn't get that. I, 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 yeah, I, I, read, it. I read it fast. And I, I couldn't I, follow the conversation. It sounded like a good one. It's, a good, it's a good quote. But it's talking about, you know, he, we were talking last night about getting the, the, the revolutions of the soul corrected, mm -hmm. rectified, okay. and they've been screwed up since birth. And at several passages, it looks like the senses are one of the objects of, of um, non-rectified. You know, because they rush into the soul and... Are they, like, different from mm -hmm. the circle of the other? Well, not according to that quote. The quote, mm -hmm. that quote says the circle of the, the circle of the other recognizes right opinion, or well, ends up right. with... That's right. True opinion or something like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas the circle of the same is what ends up with, with knowledge. Or, I don't know if mm -hmm. it's... Yeah. So that would, But so I kept thinking on my way here of the fact that um, they both represent states of mind, right? As does... So that state of mind, is that similar to the symposium at the highest point? Or, or am I misreading and I could stand being corrected? <laughs> but the, see, the symposium is not the ultimate state. Mm. Not even Socrates is, because uh, we have no info on what he was doing in the 24 hours in the... In the Field standing. Yeah, in the description in the Geotima speech. Okay, right, you're right. right. We only get so far. See, the, the basic problem in, in Plato is that there is evidence that he knows the difference between the brilliant light of being, right, which is what he describes at 518 in the Republic, mm -hmm. and the one, or the one self mm -hmm. we now would call it, yes. right? Yes, yes. Right. Both of those can be talked about in terms of wisdom, but only one of them can be talked about in terms of knowledge. Hmm. So, so when, you'd say, are, am I correct? The brilliant light of being. Would, which one is where? That's knowledge. Yeah, is knowledge. And a certain kind of wisdom is and, oneself. Right? Yeah. Behind. No. 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 Oh, sorry. Ask your question. Well, he said that gotten... wisdom can be ascribed to both the first and second hypothesis, but knowledge can only be ascribed to the second hypothesis. That's right. So I was wondering how, how, and I'm just trying, looking for clarity there. No. I mean, the question of what wisdom does to those two hypotheses as opposed to what knowledge does to those hypotheses is still hanging out. And that's the confusion in Plato. Ah. Wait, what's the confusion? Really? Be yeah, because he doesn't make that clear. Like, the only line that he really deals with the, na the nature of the one, or the good, is in one sentence, and you have to de decipher it. It's a, right, it's that complex analogy of, of the royal pair, the king and queen, on two levels. <coughs> on the level of the metaphysical and the, met and the level of phenomenal. Mm -hmm. It's a complex analogy. Hey, the, the, that's the that's the most he can say about the idea of the one standing to the brilliant light of being. Mm -hmm. He doesn't describe it. He doesn't explore that idea yeah. and the implications of it in terms of knowledge and wisdom. So, if you were to add, and, unless you're in the to uh, it, Parmenides, <laughs> unless you're into the Parmenides, and then you happen to then be required to make a leap. See, you have to, as a reader, assign those differences. You have to, second is knowledge, the first that is beyond knowledge. Mm. Mm. But he doesn't, he doesn't work those points out in a dialogue anywhere in the dialogue. Do you? You will. Do you? <laughs> you will. I do, just do. Oh, that's true. But I mean, I mean, well, no, you pointed us in the direction of where okay. to find the distinction. I mean, as I ask you, impartial observer. David. Okay. <laughs> yeah. See, that, that's why uh, Plato is not Socrates. 
No. Socrates is different than Plato. Mm. And there's good evidence that the, the gap is on, is on such a point. Mm -hmm. And the second is that he has no way of continuing the thought of Homer. He's at odds with Homer. He's at odds with the, the Iliad. He has no place for, for the midwife or Plato. Oh, is that the reason? Yeah. Okay. Oh, Plato. Yeah, it'd be nice. But then he would be doing your work, Pierre, wouldn't he? <laughs> so, this is another paper, right? Or, I don't recall in your papers that you made oh. that difference. What so I said I don't recall in any of your papers you made that difference. Man, hey, I can't keep writing just what I think. I'd be doing that all day long. Great. Well, he, 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 he does in it. a way. He says that midwifery is both platonic and Homeric. And what Pierre just said well, that's was true. that the Plato failed when he read Book 9 of the Iliad. That's right. In which that's true. Uh, the and Phoenix 11. explains not only the problem of his relationship with okay. Achilles, but also explains his problem with his own lineage and his father and grandfather. Yeah, yeah that's true. And, and it becomes a bam, 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 a, a, re, a rep, repetitive cycle. But so does, does that mean Plato doesn't rival Homer and he see it? Or he rivals? <laughs> no, see, Socrates might. Socrates might. <laughs> but not Plato. But not Plato. Okay. Hmm. Huh. That's interesting. That's fun. Very interesting. Wow. Yeah. Well, Socrates might, because Socrates, what would give Socrates the possibility? Because he transcends? Or? Be oh. Well, <coughs> look, look here. <clears throat> he has the dynamics of the family as the cause of the identification with each of the different classes. Hmm. But he has no idea of a pathologos. That is Homeric, mm -hmm. not Platonic. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Right? Mm -hmm. And he doesn't even make reference to it, because he could like conceal a lot or... or sure, mm -hmm. sure. Right, in the, in the Republic, those who can get to the gold class, you kick them out. Of the gold class, yeah. Right. Well, he could, he could easily do it. That's what he said. There are a lot of ways he could have done it. Well, it's not but, really a but, uh, born into it. Yeah, but the, if you're born into the gold class and you can't exhibit those, those qualities, right. you get booted into a lower class. But that's because you were not born gold. Right, but it's also the kids that are born in the iron class that they show gold and they get brought up. Oh yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's by, it, yeah, it is by nature, not by. Right, right. You said get to, and I'm just saying mm, it's not I, I a matter you. of achieving. Sure, right, right. As, as far as I know. I, I'm with but, you. But I'm you with have you. Depth, in depth study. Uh, no, no, I agree with you. They, they're not achieving. You're either there or you're not. Mm. Yeah, but uh, and they don't look at the blocks of what it is uh, that is keeping them from that. That's not to take away with the greatness of uh, Plato's skill in. No. I mean, he reached a high level. The, the, of, uh, uh, these conversations have currently hopped over the Theaetetus, I notice. Um, and uh, in the Theaetetus, he does recognize the the need to bring them birth false knowledge. I don't think he is is doing, you know, self reflection. But he's he, he's he's looking at abort false knowledge. Abort false false systems of thought. Yeah, sorry. But he's not working on the self. I try. I try. And he puts himself in the class of the wise and not of the knower. Right? Well, I don't know. That was too fast. He actually just says he can't, he doesn't know what knowledge yeah, yeah. is. Right. See, the key, the key thing is, in several places you can see the same thing. His solution to man's predicament in the Republic is that the ruling class has to take away from each family their children when they reach nine years or 11 years of age. 
a, that's a key that's a key pain, a key time when the imposition of pathologos can take place, mm -hmm. right? Which is the second and third grade in our culture, mm -hmm. right? Or before. But he that would be foolish if he understood midwifery. You don't have to take away children from their families. It's true. You have to be able to deal with the issue that brings about whatever it is that distorts the psyche if you leave them with the family. So his, his maneuver is to avoid what he doesn't understand, which is the nature of individual ignorance called about the logos. Interesting. And all through the Republic, he doesn't say, hey, you know what? The real goal is to know the one or the self. It's every place he says you must know the idea of the good or mm -hmm. the brilliant light of being. That's the goal. That's interesting. And uh, as magnificent as that is, it's, it's, in, it's incomplete. Yeah, in the Republic, in the allegory, it would be if he understood that, he wouldn't have, it, when the person is dazzled and then he, and he's confused about what it is he sees and then he goes back to what he formerly saw, he doesn't say that is something that by understanding why he did that could move him along. He doesn't do that. He doesn't reflect at that point at all. That's quite true. Instead... He's, instead he goes back to his former seat. Right. But in fact, if he saw the dynamics of his own pathologos, he would not go back to his same seat. Right. He would No, he couldn't. And also, it's incomplete in respect to, he doesn't tell you what those people are carrying on their heads and when they're talking what they are saying, nope. which becomes the echoes that are heard in the cave and attributed to the figures on the cave wall. Yep. Ooh, that's so cool. The closest he ah! gets, the closest he gets is yeah, the din of the yeah. din of the of the sure sophists not. and the and the many. That's it's talking. incomplete. So, yeah. It's that's incomplete. the closest he gets, but he doesn't He's say why it is that people that follow that people? din. Or why is it that they are? Many no, things. not at all. Hmm. Wow. Well, I was born in a good age. Thank you, oh, sir. I'm good. <laughs> I need it. Damn, now I just have to get into the other stuff. Well, I lived through it. When I did Being in the One, no, thanks. I assumed being was the one. That's the title. Being That's true. One. That's true. You did. Mm. Right? I had the divine illumination stuff, and I said, "That's it. That's the one. That's the highest thing." <laughs> it wasn't. What woke you up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, what woke you up? Uh, mm. Sorry, I have that. What? Yeah. Hmm. She puts it in terms of a what. Who woke you up? Who? That's another one. No, not a who. <laughs> when? No. Well, when? What is awakening? <laughs> <laughs> mm. Mm. Yeah, what woke you up? But when did that happen? And what was the in, what was the process in insight? And I asked that because I remember one time at Esalen, you were sitting talking to all of us and mentioning that when you get into the idea of the good state, now is the time, that is the time when you start asking the questions of, okay, what is this? What is it that is this light or this experience or the state of mind I'm in? And you mm -hmm. asked a whole series of questions. And I remember that, but I don't remember the questions. And you said that would be the, the, way to address the cause of that and but it's extremely difficult because of that state of the idea of the good 
is extremely difficult to challenge. In no, that. it's rather simple. Well, you may. You've gone beyond that. But, but I remember that part. No, that's you're not going to ask the simple. Version. That's what happened in England. You asked the simple version. Oh that yes, yes. In England. Yeah, no. the guy could. No, I, I actually wondered whether it had to do with a with the state of mind that you experienced in the zendo, and mm -hmm. I'm thinking didn't recognize. But then you ended up on at the beach with your wife and kids, and she was like, <laughs> "You were in a state of ultimate clarity." No. Yeah. Or is it somewhere yeah. else? Is, I mean, that it was connected to that. Yeah. Yeah. It was connected to that. Experience of ultimate clarity, where all the the um, she he she he could see what? every criticism, every pathologo she stated. He could, you know, he could identify. Thirty-two. Thirty-two. Yeah. <laughs> Thirty-two was your what, age. In like two minutes, five minutes. Out of ten and she was talking and I just made notes. Thirty two. Thirty two. Yeah, it's kinda of like mm. Eldar's being at the end last night. Mm. She first she broke a glass and then she went to a table <laughs> and then and then and then and I used to do that with my mother. Watch her go through first um, sad, hurt, <laughs> anger, m murderous rage. Uh, ex absolute pity and <coughs> And then, um, uh, and then um, punishment, mm. and it was just like, and so I do it with my kids at school when I'm teaching because I don't have to go back and see them ever again. Uh, the, 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 the the hero will always stand out, the guy who keeps learning from happening. Mm. And so mm. I, I usually point that out right away. You're going to keep this class from moving forward, aren't you? Um, and then he'll get angry. So you're going to be angry now. Uh, and then you're going to be like uh, in disbelief. Oh, that's disbelief. And then he'll go. He'll get. He'll get. Uh, More angry. Um, defensive. I said, now you're defensive. Then whatever it is, they just keep throwing things. And after about ten, I say, you want to keep going? I've seen it all. That <laughs> <laughs> if I haven't seen it, I can name it when you do it. And it shuts them up. And for the rest of their life, every kid in that class knows their game. That's right. And, right. and, it's, and, you know, I feel like I fail when I only get to do it to a senior. But if I can, I did it to some sixth, and, I mean, some seventh and eighth graders, and I really caused severe damage. But um, in the end, after a year or ten weeks or so, um, they, they, they didn't do it anymore. Mm. Because the rest of the class, I would even say, hey, um, how many times does he do this every day? Mr. Coe, he does it in all his classes. You mean you've known him for how many years? Oh, five years. He's been doing that for five years? Oh, good. You're, you are the hero in the class, sir, our young lady. You are the one who keeps learning from happening. And then I explained to him why learning is a problem and why they have no reason to be there in the first place and uh, end up with this uh, bronze statue of a learned man in front of the school that they have to p pass by and high-five every day because we have no image of a learned man, a learned individual. That's right. And they don't know why they put on their shoes. And that's why you're the hero. That's why I give that speech every time I sell. Mm. Uh, I should, I should see if my sister can have you as a guest speaker in her <laughs> class because these are like fourth graders and you could really... Oh, I'm not, I'm, it, there's, see, there's a moment of... Yeah. I see there's a moment of transmission. I've just been looking at this. What, at what particular age? Is there, is it most likely, you're saying second grade, seven, nine years old, is the greatest age for the transmission of a pathologos? Well, no, there, there are different, different phenomena that occur. <clears throat> the first, the, the, there's a critical period when the child goes into kindergarten and first grade. Okay. Why? because then they're confronted with a different reality than their home life. Absolutely. All right? Therefore, that's a crisis period. Okay. All right? and then, when they reach, say, now you're in the beginning into the third and the fourth grade, <coughs> the child then has reached a level of understanding that has to then be squashed. Mm -hmm. That's a different kind of pathologos. Is radically different. 
they, and they has have, its own marks. They have a context in yeah. which all the ramifications of not living with the path, pathologos so. will act themselves out. They know what punishment is. Mm -hmm. They know what it is to be a part of a tribe. Right. They, 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 they intuitively got all that information. Yeah. Right. So then that can all be brought together and packaged yeah. in the pathologos. Yeah. Yeah. So it has to be at that age. Right. And therefore there's a different set of pathologos that occur during the, the transition to language. Yeah. I would see that. Yeah. Which is at what age? Well, usually somewhere around between two and four. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, invariably it is without the logos. Mm -hmm. Without reason? Or yeah. Therefore, it is a more primitive ah. pathologos. It's sophistical. Yes. As we used to say, yeah. right? Yeah. The beginning yeah. of the yeah. inner sophist. Well, see, you know, the real the real problem is how did how do animals, intelligent animals, that haven't gotten the the level of language? How do they teach their young? Swatting them around. Right. Uh, hmm. I mean, there's a whole learning that goes on. Pulling them with, away. with animals pre-linguistic. Well, they have to, like the mother otter has to teach the baby otter how to swim. They don't, they aren't born knowing how to swim, so they actually have to do an instruction thing. I don't think that necessarily answers the question. I just no, no, no. I found song, that fascinating. Song yes, words equally they have well. To imitate. Uh, breastfeeding plays a major role in in, in uh, different cultures, like mm. in uh, certain areas. Uh, the mother will withdraw the nipple from the child to frustrate, continually frustrate the child. Mm. So that will bring about a hostile drive yeah, yeah, in yeah. the child, an anger, a frustration, which then becomes a warrior class. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. right. So like, learn, there's a certain kind of learning that can take place pre language. Like, what is man's real problem? Man's real problem is what do you do with language? So therefore, the origin of pathologos is coincide, coincides with the development of language, which is only according to certain theories we've only had for about 250,000 years. And therefore, the implications of language on human behavior is the problem of the pathologos of the kind that therefore manifests itself in entering into the early age of the of grade school and at nine and mm. ten especially. Mm. So uh, like we're we're working through the problems inherent in language. Yeah. And it, and therefore mm. see there is a way in which you can train your child without without language. We've done it for a billion billions of years or millions of years in human race. Therefore a new kind of Training, teaching, molding the character of the child comes in with language, and that's called the pathologos. You can see it in animal is whispers. I think that, if I understand, it, animal whispers have that. They don't use language, but they're able to communicate with the animals. Yeah. And in, in a yeah, there's a level of intelligence, but it's not lingual. Right. Have you, I just got to throw in a footnote to that. Have you guys, if any of you get Netflix uh, streaming or DVD, there is a documentary on there about one of the one of the horse whisperers, and it is. I mean, this is just a five-star documentary. You could watch it ten times over and pick something up new every time. Mm -hmm. There's the, uh, one typical quote that's wonderful. They show him on the horse. I mean, he's teaching all these, he's, he goes around the country with his truck and his horses from Tennessee to Alaska to Florida, and he's all over. And he's teaching these people to work with horses in a completely different way than their culture has taught them, which is man versus nature, and it's a fight, and right, blah, blah, blah. He's teaching them to communicate non-lingually with these animals. Oh, and they sure. have this picture where he's on the horse, mm -hmm. someone else's horse for the first time, I believe, and he's kind of doing this dance. The horse is just doing this ballet thing, right? And he's left, right, backwards, forwards. And the voiceover is, is an interview with him at a different time where he's saying, um, when you communicate with a horse, most people believe 
that about 80% of that is physical. You know, you're touching, the kicking, the, the reins, and 20% is non-physical or mind, right? He says, but actually, it's the other way around. Wow. Mm -hmm. Smart beasts. Very little of your communication should actually be physical. Most of it is up here in, in the head, yeah. between the two of you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, I mentioned that uh, we took a trip to Strawberry in Arizona, which is at uh, oh, about yeah. 6,500 feet elevation, said to be the most pure air air and uh, it was a goat farm and the llamas were there and I talked to the owner and I said what are your stories with the con well, tell me about what when you have people come on talk to me he said well he said well I'll tell you a story it happened the other day he said this autistic kid came in with the family and he was depressed and he said, I just pointed out the llama, and he walked over. For the next eight hours, the two bonded. Wow. And the guy woke up. The boy woke up? The autistic kid oh, woke up. Wow. Yeah. I said, you have other stories like that? He said, oh, yeah. I said, you know what you need to do? You always write it up. Shoot. Your stories have to become public knowledge. Yeah, it's not just something that happened. Yeah, That's yeah. So we had several stories of a like kind, and I said, "Hey, you got to start yeah. writing. Come on, now, get off your ass and do some writing." Mm. Jesus okay. Christ! Must have had some great communication with the llama. Yeah. Autistic yeah. kids he are. Said, he said at the end, they just walk together. They'd yeah. walk together and they'd he'd turn around and the animal would turn around and they'd, like in a ballet, they would together. Well, have you ever seen that book? Um, I bring it around every once in a while. It's a trifle strange but fascinating. It's called Dancing with Cats. And mm -hmm. ah, so, and they teach, uh, they, they actually describe how you can learn to dance with your cat. But they show this one little boy who's maybe three years old and he and the cat completely imitate each other when they are not even seeing each other like they yeah. like you you see this a man and a and a cat a cat doing the same thing but and apparently there's a way in which that happens but this is they're not even looking at each other so they're and they're like mirroring mm. one another so very intimate and nonverbal and you know amazing yeah I've seen some videos with cats that can Have do you? amazing tricks and I think the cats do is he doesn't want to talk to me, I won't talk to him, you know, and that's how most cats live their lives. But uh, when you get a cat, uh, this cat was like hanging out with dogs and riding skateboards and jumping on a surfboard and oh. his momentum would move the surfboard across the pool and then he'd oh, jump yeah, off yeah. on the other side <laughs> and he could, he could um, uh, use the, the guy's back as a springboard to do something else mm. and cool. incredible stuff mm. and it was you said what? that's a cat and so your your your, your conversation yeah is, yeah um, you know it kind of explains cats they don't want to talk to me fuck them I'll just, <laughs> I'll just walk away I won't listen to them <laughs> have you ever seen the book why cats paint mm -mm. that's just on the same uh, mm. I'll see if I can Root it out and bring it in. What you're saying but of is course, cats aren't the only ones who paint. Uh, elephants also paint. Horses mm -hmm. have been known to paint. Uh, very interesting. I mean, they, they have they have uh, fundraisers now in Thailand um, for the elephants by selling in New York City galleries the paintings that Thai elephants have made. Mm. And at first they thought, well, these are just abstract. But you know, people can see what what. They can see, you can see the figure in it that the elephant is trying to make. Very interesting. Have you seen those videos of the person playing the violin to the two elephants and stuff? And the mm -hmm. elephant, you know, that they come across a pasture to listen to this person playing classical music on the so violin, and then they begin to sway in time with the music. <laughs> it's very interesting. Wow. Have you have you seen the? I love. I want to jump on that. Have yeah. you seen the YouTube videos of people's dogs? Uh, there's a guy with a beagle. Be beagles are kind of stout, right? Not really. And, and the beagle gets up on the piano, and his 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 his, his, pa his ungainly paws are resting on the keys. 
And all he does is clunk one or two of the keys, and then he goes, oh! <laughs> <laughs> he hits another one, oh! Beagle or Bassett? Because beagles are trim. So, really? I think it is a beagle, actually. <laughs> it might be trimmer than I'm playing Because Bassett sometimes are a little more... I don't know anything about them. So, the training... You don't, I thought you had a Bassett. I am and, and teaching the logo to the family can be either linguistic <laughs> at the time of language development as a first in <laughs> society and as a first into the realm of understanding is what you just said. And and after seven it really doesn't work. Or after nine. Could you say that again? Dave? Well, well I'm not so I, sure. I was just kind of watching the conversation. There was the pre linguistic level, yes. you know, the tit. Um, the language development and, and food and probably mm -hmm. warmth and other things. Language development where the vocabulary that they're allowed to mm -hmm. express themselves so entering society where they get that first shock of mm -hmm. why they're different or why she doesn't like me or something. Mm -hmm. um, entering into understanding no. at <clears throat> third or fourth grade level. See, every family knows that there's a limit to introducing the pathologist. Yeah, that's kind of what's the And that is when the child has the ability to say no. Wow. <laughs> then it, then no new pathologos can enter into say the no. person. <laughs> it's Amazon. over. Right? Here, say no or act on no. Well, I guess that's a pathologist will not work if the child can question what is going on. Mm. At what age, of, what age of maturity must that be for a child to be able to take that kind of stance in respect to the imposition of a pathologist? Once that, once that point is reached, nothing new can enter into mm. because, the pathologist. Because it's even if they do acquiesce, even if they do go along, it's a choice. But if they do they go know along, doing it's it. because of some prior teaching that they go along, but no new element yeah. can be introduced. No. So about how old is that, Pierre? Well, usually, you, you know, uh, as you listen to, like, how many people have, would you say you've listened to stories and dreams and going back into the past, do you find the imposition of the pathologos that began after 13? Yeah, mm -hmm. no. No, it's it's almost like that verifying it in various forms after thirteen. The very first lesson I think our family learned was not to say no, oh. and that made it much easier for them. Once the parent realizes the child can say no, it's over. All they can do is maintain what already exists. I was going to oh. let you. Oh, okay. Tap it on me. <laughs> <laughs> I saw my friend go. Jeff, Sandy would go. Panic. Thank you. It's interesting because in research, what they found was their the brain the in terms of brains uh, that there's an explosion of activity in after 13 in the adolescent period, which is another creative uh, era time period that's similar to what happens to children in pre-kindergarten um, pre and then at about six and mm -hmm. then about eight or nine. And, it, and those periods are it physically when the child is, their brain is uh, um, exploding, I guess, or the way they talk about it. Uh, Maturing in a in a in a different kind of way and expanding. Called puberty. So it's not just uh, a period that the parents are seeing, maybe instinctively, but that there's a physical correlation apparently at those times where the children are maturing beyond what. Uh, would be described as the pathologos if they saw that the kid was going beyond that. Yeah, well, you could go on and say there's a biochemical correlate to every experience and there's a physiological basis for every learning. Yeah, yeah. Well, 
No, I just thought it was interesting that no, no, in, in terms yeah. of the time periods that you're yeah. talking about, yeah. when's you, the imposition? So I'm not, I'm not, I I I didn't understand the way that it was presented that it's just that you could make a correlation. I it seemed like you were just dismissing just, it. I I'm always going, dismiss it. Oh, okay. Well, dismiss it then. Dismiss everything else too. Yeah, be, the only reason is because that tends to be reductionist kind of thinking. That's typical among science and, and, and that's reductionist thinking. Oh, I don't think I was presenting it as please, reductionist. Please, please, I don't want to do this. Count me out. But I, I saw, uh, I, I know a young gentleman, he's in his mid-teens now, and I've had a chance to watch him every other weekend or every weekend growing up. And it's clear that uh, right around 13 or so, he did, I mean, the word I used for it was, I, 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 the metaphor is his head began to come up. Like he begins to look around him and go, no, I don't think so. Or, yeah, fine, but, you know, I know what you're really doing, right? <laughs> I, I, I saw that more and more in him. But even when I knew him at seven and eight, he has, uh, this particular guy has a particular, has a very nice way of getting along um, without directly confronting everyone because of his family game, but he's still not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And he began to be labeled on the records at school, the magic word, they, you guys will know, defiant. And yet, and that's a nasty word to have on your record, despite the fact uh, and I fought against it, despite the fact that he, always his best, you know, in the early grades, they rate you for social comportment and how well you get along with others, and right? And they stopped doing that somewhere after elementary school, right? But in those early grades, that was always his best grade, A+. Plus. Gets along with everybody, knows exactly what's going on, has amazing social and emotional intelligence. There's nobody who doesn't love this kid. He's got tons of friends. The teachers love him, right? Defiant, though. That's what somebody in the office labeled him when he got sent down there. Well, there was, yes, and that ha there was one time where the teacher asked him, um, uh, "What's going on? Uh, why why aren't you interested in this? What's you know?" And he said something. I forget what exactly the question was, but his answer was, "Maybe I don't want to." For that, he got sent to the principal and was called disrespectful, another nasty word. And I gave the principal a, <laughs> I said, look, in front of everybody, I said, hey, if you want honesty out of your kids, you better be prepared for what honesty looks like. You told your, the principal that? In front of everybody at an IEP. Wow. I said, that's what honesty looks like. Hey, did he use any swear words? Nope. Did he call you any names? Nope. Did he get up and stamp around? Nope. Did he answer your question respectfully, but not in a way that you wanted to hear? Yep. Yeah. Wow. Did you get the defiant? And word? everybody in the room was like going, "Yeah." And you no, know, there was silence. Even the even the principal had to go, "Yeah, I, I got it." <laughs> but they didn't remove it from his record. <laughs> I have a good. I have a yeah. good one. Uh, we moved to a new school. Right? Fourth grade. <laughs> I'm a new kid. My mother still dressed me as if we came off the boat from Europe. <laughs> right? oh, In a very tough Irish neighborhood. Yeah. The borderline to Harlem, mm. on Convent Avenue, if you know New York. And so this teacher had to give a performance using the class as her acting pool. And I was chosen to be the lead figure in this play. <laughs> By the way, the key point in the play was a piss, piss fight. The teacher picked on a very short Irish kid, and I was tall, foreigner, dressed like my mother dressed me, and I said to myself, this 
is not going to go. Kiss your active bike. So the, <coughs> the Irish kids started getting to the kid and started giving him training on how to fight, you know, make, beat this goddamn foreign kid, you know. And it was intense. Mm -hmm. So I figured this is not going to go very well for me. Uh, no one's helping me. I'm going to go up there and now I'm going to be beaten up in public by this little Irish kid and I'm going to have to now deal with the being in this school for the rest of four years. So I said, I know what I'm going to do. Went back to the classroom. Waited for the teacher to turn around and beamed her. Brilliant. Mm. Teacher turned around and said, who did that? I said, I did. <laughs> said, you better not do that again or you're not going to be the star of the play. <laughs> nice. Pat <laughs> <laughs> <Had> her up. <laughs> <laughs> she took me off, see, and they, uh, that behavior, they brought me before a psychiatrist. Mm. Mm. Wow. Was that serious, you see? <laughs> No one asks what the hell happened mm -hmm. mm. because they're, they're all professionals and they know that things... A bad that, kid when it is a bad kid. Yeah, bad yeah, behavior yeah, needs yeah, to be stamped yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So on my record then became this kid oh who God. rebels and throws things <laughs> at the teacher and therefore I had somewhat of a difficulty through my schooling mm. with that kind of record. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they follow you around, those ladies, oh, yeah. don't they? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, But um, I but, got out of it. Yeah. And but then, that really then I went to, uh, we're, then we had an Italian group. And I went to this Italian kid, and I said, you're the toughest son of a bitch in school, okay? I said, I want you to teach me how to fight. Mm. All right. He said, all right, I'll tell you what. He says, you come down to where we live. There was an iron grating there on the ground. And he said, we'll fight every day. I said, okay. <laughs> so I put up with it for about six months. Every day would fight. And that's how I survived in New York. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Wow. <laughs> cool. Uh, but you, failed in school. Yeah, I, failed in school for yeah, some reason. Yeah, but he somehow stayed alive. I didn't have much respect for teachers after that. I never knew why. <laughs> you, you mentioned that there's a different kind of belief, different kind of pathologos at each of the levels that mm -hmm. David has captured. Mm -hmm. I just wrote it down. I wondered if you could yeah. Yeah. characterize that. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. The early ones carry an image that becomes identifiable as a nearly physically from the early stage, from introduction, from say, you know, five to nine, five mm -hmm. to eight. Hmm. A physical self-image kind of thing. Yeah, it affects them. It affects yeah, their, yeah. their mode, their body, their movement, the way they are, the way they relate. Hmm. And therefore, it's, it's uh, fundamental. Okay. And the other is interpersonal. The other kind of pathos. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So only two. So two? I thought we had three, really. Yeah, I thought we had three, too. The suprapersonal. Suprapersonal? Yeah, like cultural stuff or, uh, or oh, religious views. or. Uh, <laughs> He's suggesting the third category. Do you buy into it? Well, I heard it from him a long time ago. Because I was dealing with some stuff on that level. Of saying, this isn't no, stuff I, you learn the, the from as a The terminology, I understand, it's just whether... At what point that, if that's a class and a temporal stage, mm. at what point are we talking about that? Uh, I, 
I got you. I don't know. When you're willing to die for it, it becomes super personal. Yeah. My guess. Yeah. Wow. I had another question, which was, if we finish that, which I don't know if we have, but um, you mentioned that animals communicate, animals teach their young in a different way, and we identified there was no logos, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that logos comes in, what, around three years old, wasn't that what you were saying, the beginnings of logos? And yet, and then I made some smart-ass comment about it being the softest, because it wasn't... So I guess I wonder what difference the Logos makes. And are we talking every Logos is a path of Logos or something? I don't know how to phrase that question. Hmm. So I'm trying to distinguish what difference the Logos makes. Is it that people only people can learn lies? <laughs> Not animals. Mm. Yes. Hmm. Boy, would you agree? Sense. Would you agree that there are some people who can recall and uh, major events in their life when they have just perhaps dawned in the period of language development, two and a half, two, five. Mm -hmm. Well, what do they? What is that? Uh -huh. See, it's a pathologos. And uh, it's invariably uh, um, an image that's created rather than words. Mm -hmm. An image of what a parent is, uh, who to fear, what to fear. Mm -hmm. And who you are yeah. in that. Yeah. Yeah. Because there, there's a violation of a person's very being at those ages. Hmm. And vice versa. Wow. What, what do you mean by that? That violation of their being? Well, because it's pre-linguistic. Pre um, um. <coughs> like there's no way to sugarcoat it. Well, what you need, see, what you need is of some volunteers who can recall some event that turned out to be a major, played a major role in the formation of their own personality. Oh, here you go. When they could recall an event <laughs> before three two. years old. One and two yeah. and a half. The the one memory, the, I recall you, you brought something to it. You asked me the state of mind. It's uh, I'm one years old, I'm sitting at a birthday party in a high chair, and it's, the memory is more just kind of a pan panoramic, it's yeah. just stuff's happening. Uh, the only thought in the state of mind was wonder. I was just, wow. So, uh, but the next one, two and a half, the day my brother was born, I don't care is in that. And it's not, I don't, I don't, my parents didn't talk to me about any of it. Just, I recall something, I'm playing uh, in this hospital with a little car and a nurse gives me the crappy ice cream with the wooden spoon. I was having a great time with this other kid who's having a brother that day, but my, some about my dad being excited, you know, like you have a brother and I didn't care. Like, I didn't even know what it meant. So it didn't, it meant nothing to me and I just still have this, I don't care. And it doesn't have the weight that I don't care picks up later on when I go through some other stuff, but nevertheless, it's there. So it makes me like, did I pick it up from the family or did I come into the world with that? But I don't know. But I'm like, that's the first spot where I can recognize and not caring. Jeff, you said at one year old, you had a wow experience. Yeah. yeah talk about it. Uh, I'm sitting in a high chair. Mm -hmm. They're having a birthday party for yeah. me, which I don't really, I, I doubt sure. that's more on yeah. what I've been told, I think. I, I was just amazed. Uh, the state of wonder. See. Wow. See, that must mean, in contrast to the way you experience your life before that event, mm. you discovered a new way of being, a new way of experiencing. 
Or you wouldn't have said, wow. I, you know, I could assume it'd be hard to really stay, but uh, there wasn't a party going on every day. Yes. And this was quite a bit different. There's a lot of things happening in this yes. house. See. I'm the center of attention in a lot of ways, see. I think. So, uh, see, that's, see all, everything you're saying suggests that those elements may not have been present in your life before that event. I would tend to say likely, right? right. So now you knew what it would be like to be the center of attention since it looks like that element may not have been present in your past. You know, I don't even, I don't know if I'd go even with center of attention because this memory, it's not a bunch of people coming to me necessarily. Yeah. They're, they're doing stuff and I'm just yeah. watching. But what you're experiencing is essential, right? Which is difference. Yeah, sure, sure. And the, the, what is the significance of that difference? Say, what did that, what did that do for you from that point on? I don't know. Yeah, no, no. See, first of all, it woke you up. Woke you up. You became aware of a, a difference, a major difference that you appreciated. Hey, that's the dawn of understanding. You woke up to something. You found it very positive. Yeah, no. Therefore, your mind now is open to that kind of experience. See, you learn from the experience. See, we're here to learn. You learn something then. And now you move then from the first to the third year. Two and a half. Two and a half. Okay, stay with and, that. Well, that was but now very you, positive as well. Like, I see. My parents weren't, I wasn't getting attacked by my parents for doing anything. I mean, I was having a blast. Now, notice, <coughs> why would you say that, that you weren't being attacked? By your parents. Well, say like uh, when could I that start have been getting the into million? four and five and six, I could remember other scenes there where you know other early memories. There's stuff happening. It's very strange. Like you know, why are they doing that? As we're uh, this one here, I don't. Mom's not even in the picture. My brother isn't in the picture. I don't know where they were. If I saw them that day, I don't remember. It was more my dad was around and he was very happy and excited and bro you have a brother. Oh, you saw him in a new way. He was very, yeah, in a good way. See what you're doing? You're building up a set of memories that are shaping your way of viewing the world. Right, and he, I, so I'm yeah. like, yeah, you have a brother, and I was just like, I don't care. Yeah. I don't even know if those words are there. It's more of just mm -hmm. a, a feeling, like, but I didn't know what it, brother meant nothing to me. I like your recollection of the spoon and the ice cream. That meant a lot to me. What did, what, what did, it, <laughs> what did that, come on, talk about it. So, I mean, right now, a cheap ice cream with a wooden spoon, those are horrible. I wouldn't want one at all. But when you're a little kid, that's great. A nurse gave me a... I'm hanging out with this other little kid in similar age, and we had a... It's like a Hot Wheels... It was a car that had a key with a spring, and if you hit the spring, the, the key, mm -hmm. if you squeezed it, the car would shoot off. So yeah. we were taking turns playing with this car. So you became attentive, appreciative, mm -hmm. right? Difference. Again, a difference, positive difference. You, you're now carrying that along with the other experiences which are positive and different. Sure. No language, but changing you and maturing you. You're right. You're telling us the history of your waking up, your appreciation of your mind. That's, that's a beautiful beginning that you, you're still in. My parents didn't believe me for a long time. Ah, see? They're like, you couldn't remember that. I'm like, but yet I remember this and this. And they're like, that happened. 
How the hell do you remember that? I'm like, I don't know. But yet I do. In both cases. It was memorable. Right. That's, how, that's why you remembered it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you might argue that in both cases the parents were so completely preoccupied with other issues, especially in the first one, mm -hmm. that I you were the out, of their, out of their, their sphere and were allowed to get into your groove. Yes. And with the birthday party it might have been similar in that because you were getting so much tension they wouldn't dare intervene in public. Mm -hmm. Though, well, the first birthday party, I don't know if I remember this so well, but my mom said my first year she didn't give me sugar at all. She was determined to be, sure. we're not going to wreck my kid with all this crap. Damn. And somebody handed me birthday cake, and I loved it, I guess. And she said she broke. <laughs> let me have it. <laughs> see? See? Now you're pulling in addition. Yeah, see, all of these have... No, I don't really recall that so much, but she added that and said, I'd just let you have the damn cake, and I gave up on sugar after that. I'm like, huh, curious. <laughs> oh, okay. Hmm. Sure. Yep. Well, I was thinking of, my earliest memory was like nine months, <coughs> something like that. Sure. Wow. And I, and this is the deal. I can remember sitting on this wooden floor in a wet, dirty diaper, crying. My face was totally, totally snot and water and sweat and was hot. And I'm watching my mother and my father go upstairs to a bedroom, intimately, right? And it, it seems to me that I got the sense that I could be an extreme Misery. Misery. And that wasn't important. In fact, that might even be the precondition for them to ah, take right. off. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Wow. Right. Yep. See, you're seeing. Yeah. Right. Judging. Yeah. Nonverbal. We had that. Nonverbal. Nonverbal. Yep. Yep. And what age was that? Nine months or so. I was still in the what? diaper sitting on the... I, I, I don't think I was a year old. Nine, ten months, something like that. I was in a crib, holding onto the edge and bouncing up and down. But the interesting thing was, and, I'm, and the parents were in and out, but the interesting thing was I can remember looking at my face. And I just thought, could that have been like almost an out-of-body experience? Mm, yes. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. like, yes. And, and I could have been, you know, maybe a year and a half or something. Sure. Uh, I can remember the, the white t-shirt. The, uh, the clean diapers, uh, yeah. holding on to the edge of the crib, and bouncing up and down, and all, all of a sudden I was watching myself do that. That's right. Maybe there was a mirror cool. in the room. See? You started philosophy at that age. Yeah. Somehow, yeah. yeah. That there's a different, there can be a different way of being than the everyday world. Yeah. And then I can remember much later, witnessing the day my mother decided that she no longer wanted to take any interest in pathologos mm -hmm. or anything. She just wanted out of being a mother. Mm -hmm. oh. And how she did it, and how she lined us all up and, and beat us all against the wall, basically bam, 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 and uh, went out and got a job and we never saw her again. So. Um, how old were you? Oh, that was a little older. That was about six or seven. I think I may have been in the second grade. Sure. So, yeah. so lining you up, right? Yeah. And, and then, noticeably, she was no longer in her life. And, and we no longer shared in what she wanted. She wanted to do other things than be a mother. You, yeah. She closed the door on her being a mother. Yeah. Yep. And therefore, you have to live without a mother. Pretty much. With a mother who isn't playing mother. Yeah. Now, there were a couple of things that were allowed in my family. One of them was humor. Mm -hmm. And even though my father hated it, he'd always say, when I told the joke, the world hates a white ass, white ass, he brought me Pogo, every volume of Pogo. He would read it on the bus on the way home. I've got, and I still collect them. Here. And that was incredibly profound political and social satire. And so, un unbeknownst to him even, maybe, 
I, I got a sense of, of, of the world sure. and how it functions to Walt Kelly, even no. Walt Kelly, no. pretty profound stuff. Um, so there is room for truth in our family, but it has to be through this. For me, it was through humor. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and that's why I'm kind of a silly guy when I substitute, when, when I teach and stuff. It's got to be funny or it's not good teaching, which isn't true. Mm -hmm. It's got to be quiet. <coughs> the, the, the fun question from all of this is, um, what did you bring into the world to, to make that conclusion that you reached? What is it that framed that experience so that you could then come to those conclusions well, without words, but nonetheless a conclusion? Uh, it goes back to uh, my sister who was a prenatal nurse taking care of prenatals and she said to me one year, she said, you know, the idea that children are born with a clean slate is absurd. She said, once you're with prenatal children, you can see their distinctive differences and recognize them from that point on so long as they're with you. Right? So like, right, we, we already come in with a richness and then these experiences occur, and then we understand it in those terms, which is why twins never have the same problems, even though they may go through precisely the same kind of situations that may have generated the pathologies. Because they come into the world with something, no clean slate. So we're learning, you know, we're learning things, we're learning, learning beings from the earliest age. <clears throat> what is the, there's a, a Greek word for that, I, Barbara, David, I, that's in one of the dialogues. And I, I only remember that we were at the pond uh, in Huntington Beach on a Saturday and we were going over that dialogue. I wish I could remember more detail. But Juan was there and we were, trying to capture what that word meant and it we ended up deciding it means something like a way of being that you take with you mm -hmm. out of this life and into the next and I can't yeah. remember what that word was but I think that's what you're yeah. in the Republic they talk about taking your education and nurture mm -hmm. and that's all you take with you right but I don't know if those I'd have to look back I mean I think education would be, my guess would be paideia, right? Mm -hmm. But it could be musicase or something. I don't know, I'd have to look up the quote. Yeah, Nurture's yeah. going to be trophy, usually something like that, right? No, it, it had more to do with, we were even talking Aethos about... Aethos is, is the conditioning of the soul, right? And that's what first came to my mind. It, that whatever you, how you live conditions your, your psyche. Brings about it. Therefore, they translate ethos as state sometimes. So what was the original, the, the original three words? If I, yeah, maybe Juan will remember. I'll get in touch. But with a way him. of coming to. It's like a way of being that you take, or it's it's, it's a way of being that you take with you. And bring with you into the next incarnation. Hmm. Um, in a way, it, it's it seemed, if I remember the discussion, that it was. I wouldn't say fundamental, but much more fundamental, at least, than things you learn in school. It's, it's, it's more like the problems that you have and the way, exactly what Pierre is saying. That, uh, what is it that you brought into the world that allowed you to conclude as you did when presented with this, such a scene? Because it wasn't just the parental handling of it, it was your conclusion based on what you brought with you. And I, I, I really, uh, I wish I could remember so that it, word. Is it, is it karma? Almost, it? yeah, we discussed karma around that. Like maybe that's the platonic kind of way of talking about karma. Because this conversation has been a lot about what our original nature is. Yeah. Kind of inadvertently 
but you're, you're adding that. And it was a long word too. It was the, kind of the the the, 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 ag the, uh, the aggregation of of pathologos. Yeah, it, it was almost. If I remember the discussion, it was almost like a snapshot. Mm -hmm. This is like a snapshot of your current it. state of what you're bringing with you, the problems that you haven't yet solved in yourself, and that you're going to have to now continue on in the next right. Right but there. that goes right along with the original nature, because right there in many of these conversations and sharing we have, there seems to be something about, I mean, I, I, I beg to differ with you about the idea of a mirror, because I could see myself from different angles. Um, well, and that, yeah. and uh, you found wonder, pure and simple, um, not, not having been taught that as part of the family milieu. So the, it, both of them go kind of along. Mm -hmm. um, Would that have anything to do with lot being a mm -hmm. lot? You're, 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 Choosing yeah, your lot yeah, yeah. as a result <laughs> of your... Choosing your lot, but, but not forgetting your original nature somehow. Well, they, so take they that say river, that, river remember you're supposed to meet that, find that guy who can teach you how to know what the effect of wealth is, for yeah. example, uh -huh. on, on the soul, mm -hmm. on the life. Well, that's Because you have to, but I thought the lots were thrown out and you picked mm -hmm. up the one next to you, There's, so that, to speak. That's right. Well, that's what probably why Pi is so you, important. Then you're in a in a queue, so to speak, to go out and choose, right, the life that you want. But they say that even if you're at the very end, even if you're choosing the last, that you'll still find the one mm -hmm. that you want. Mm -hmm. right. But then Pi. But they give examples. But, but finding that person is an act of Pi I was just thinking out loud here. The fundamental purpose of education is lead the self to actualize the self. True. That would be the true meaning of education, like finding that person that would be able to separate out the different implications of your life. Hmm. That's one of the good insights of Rouse. <coughs> he was willing to say enlightenment, and isn't it in the Rouse that the parable is the parable of enlightenment and non-enlightenment or something along that line, whereas that most people translate it as in education and ignorance. Mm -hmm. I think that's Jowett that mm -hmm. does Is it Jowett that does enlightenment? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was like, I think whoever I saw that in was, it's like one of the few times they actually showed <laughs> on pretty sure many it's, levels. Yeah, I think it's Jowett. Yeah, Jowett. <laughs> yeah, Jowett. Not, he, even he can't get everything wrong. That's right. <laughs> Jowett, Jowett uses enlightenment and unenlightenment <laughs> in the introduction of the allegory of the cave. Yeah. And that's, a, that's major. Wow. And how? That. Yeah. I wonder if Julie's. Did you know my our friend Julie? Have you ever met that woman? No. Really? Well, you know, <laughs> sometimes on Sundays I meet with her in a group of es to see Aeschylus in this place. Es es Aeschylus. Yeah. Is that she a She should describe her pro her present project. Oh. I was rather hoping she was absent because she was well. Madly what, you know, put a question forward. Julie, how is that going? Want to bring everybody <coughs> in on the nature of that project that you're going to be taking on? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, you always say that, but go ahead anyways. Well, I mean, it was trying to find the self in the tragedies, in Aeschylus, seeing the role of the self. And we were seeing it in... The Persians. Trying to distinguish the Persians from the Greeks and from the Hellenes and seeing that, well, it was a hypothesis I was entertaining that maybe the Hellenes were more self-oriented and the Persians were more other-oriented. So it's hmm. And you wanted around. to know? Well, she, she actually, did. she was saying she <coughs> had seen at various points quotes yeah. where the Hellenes in the mm -hmm. play were represented as were as being as using autos as being um, looking to themselves to make their decisions, mm -hmm. whereas yeah. the Persians were not, and that there were quotes all along in there. She was thinking. Yeah, I saw a few places. I need yeah. to go back and get those. So nail them down. Yeah, because <laughs> right? Wouldn't that yeah. be fun? 
When are you doing it? Uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, 525? No. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know when I'm doing Have you got your taxes? <clears throat> Get your class my done. done. Then you have no excuse. Oh. Well, Julian, you know, most of the Persians I know in Orange County um, <laughs> yes. have several families, and they are seriously into family. Mm. Yeah. They're, they're really, and they're proud of it, and they're very, you know, I mean, they vary, but that's the, uh, right, that's the other, right, that they're into. Mm -hmm. Is it not? Mm -hmm. But that may be a way to preserve the cultural identity and and the myth of the family to, oh, to sure. eliminate to to you know everything's done with the family big dinners going out to eat going to other people's families that are in the community that's, that's just a way of keeping the path below those narrowed in yeah that's what that's one but the thing is lack of self the persians right? like one thing we discovered it came off of a question of Bill Gilbert's actually. Mm -hmm. He asked, um, "Why do the why are the Persians represented as having a Greek religion?" It, they're so in the play they don't show on stage the Persians practicing Persian religion, but Persians practicing Greek with Greek gods. And, so they're saying what he was saying. Why is that? And can, he wanted to, so. Um, of course, then they're doing the rituals of the other. So yes, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. So we looked at, we looked at an article by Smythe. I happened to mm -hmm. I was looking for something else. I was and because I was wondering if he anyway. So um, he quotes Herodotus in the very first paragraph, mm. and he says, and Herodotus, I that I found Herodotus, and Herodotus says that well no wrong <coughs> erase go back on the tape. In, in the book on, in the commentary on Aeschylus, on the Persians, by Smythe, he says that the Aeschylus's purpose was to present an, an idealized picture of the Persians, and therefore to drop away anything extraneous to his point, because he thought that, the, that, that then the Greeks would be better able to see um, the dilemma of the loser, as well as the dilemma of the winner, that the Persians were led into making the Xerxes was led into that terrible error through hubris, mm -hmm. and therefore he, his theory was that the per Athenians in the audience would look at a depiction, and they wouldn't be in a way um, what distracted by foreign mm -hmm. elements, but they would see human beings suffering at the loss of this huge loss themselves, them, and and would therefore be able to say, oh, this is where hubris takes you. This mm -hmm. is where right. So. Um, that was one of the thoughts that was raised in our exploration. Mm -hmm. And then Julia was see seeing that in the text, she saw that the Greeks represented them, or Aeschylus represented the Greeks as, again, self-oriented, coming from self. And, the, and of course, the Persians, like the Russians, no, like the French, and, and uh, in War and Peace, right, were invading a country that wasn't theirs, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, that was kind of what we were playing with. But Julia, but the, you know, notion tie in with the suppliant maidens also that the suppliant maidens uh, aren't Persians, aren't aren't Trojans. They're really Greek. Yeah. And mm -hmm. to see a Greek with in different clothing is still to see a Greek. Yeah. And in fact, I was going to ask you about that quote. Hmm. That's Aristotle well, who says that one is Hellenic by mind and not by mm -hmm. any other method, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what we were considering. That's what Suffering Maiden shows. That's when they made the decision. That's when the, the king made the decision to back the Suffering Maidens was when he saw they were willing to commit suicide to hang themselves from the statues of the gods in the sacred grove rather than submit to um, an unjust marriage to these, mm -hmm. to their cousins essentially, mm -hmm. right? So. so what was Bill Gilbert's question? I gave that at the beginning. You didn't hear it? Oh, I You I even didn't. nodded. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good. His question okay, was... Okay, if you said it, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure you said it. Huh. I missed okay. that I... Spotted. You know what it is. You were asking me to yeah, moderate it for the sake mm -hmm. of everybody. Yeah. So, I thought it was so fascinating that she can really show that. Julia can really show that. Yeah, that would be fascinating. 
when, when I hope gonna, I can. When are you going to do it? I don't know. You always ask such questions. It would be a nice chapter <laughs> in your book. Yo. The I'm book right. you're writing. Yeah, it would be. <laughs> That's fascinating, though, to take It's it. not that long. We're only talking 47 pages. The play. The play. So, um... And it was written within, maybe you know that, it was written within eight years of the actual battle. So they were <coughs> arguing that one of the things he had to deal with was he didn't, that he had two, like, what, strings to his bow. He had patriotism and he had religion. Those were mm -hmm. the, and, he, and rather than a play having a single focus, it had a dual focus. Mm -hmm. And that made it hard to write. And he, in the article uh, written by Smythe in the commentary, he talks about the fact that, um, that's a very difficult piece of writing to do, and he compares it with a bunch of other things. So that's not a nice model, man. There are some good people, you know, in that age. Of oh, yeah. Those, yeah. Some good thinkers that we don't seem to have, barring yourself, today. Mm. I mean, there may be a few, I don't know. I'm yeah, it's hard to them. juggle Netflix, Hulu, and scholarship. Well, <laughs> and the thing was, he sets up... Smythe sets up this whole comparison with what if a work had been written about the Spanish Armada, about the defeat of the Spanish Armada, mm. at a time when people who had made that battle were present. I mean, it's yeah. kind of, yeah. so it's like a very... <coughs> kind of yeah. Same thing with World War II. Would it be not interesting yeah. if ten years after someone did a play on the Germans? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And tried to get us to see that winning is not the only thing. Well, Pierre, uh, would you please remind me of the fellow that you have told us several times wrote such a wonderful book about the Germans. He was apparently a prisoner in uh, one of their camps, Nazis all around him, and he was and he wrote apparently in a very metaphorical or poetic way, oh, but it really yeah. captured. What was his name? Carlo Levi. Right. He's an Italian Jew. An Italian Jew. I have to admit, I, uh, uh, the uh, UCI library has it. I got it out upon your recommendation and tried to make it through the floor. Wow. <laughs> hey, Sandy, Sandy, go. Oh, no. Dog and cat. <laughs> Very large cat. Whoa. <laughs> that was the size of a territorial or cat Norwegian got out. forest cat. That's her cat. Is that her cat? I believe wow. so. No, 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 no. Ran no. like hell after no. Yeah. That's not Sebastian. Are you so yeah, but oh, no. That's a great cat. Great cat. Yeah. 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 So what, what about the? So I tried to re I I tried to get into the first three pages and it was absolutely. What's the, what is the name of the book? Carlo Levi. Fear of freedom. Uh, the, uh, fear yes. and freedom. Fear and freedom. Or the fear of freedom or variations of that. And I, I I'm I'm sorry, Pierre. I could not. Fathom it. It was. No, it was a cat. Okay, yeah, the cat got away. Okay. Way over my head. But what I, but what got me interested, and I would love to get back into it if I could, is is your recommend. Talk over. Yeah. Was it a raccoon and not a cat? No, it was a cat. Big ass cat. Is that his cat? Beautiful cat. No, I think it goes back there, but it's a feral cat. It looks like. So, was your recommendation? Then a rat. And then a dog. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So go ahead. Your recommendation, which is what we're touching on now, I think, with Aeschylus, um, that here's a person who, uh, actually, in the time, not ten years later, is looking at the state of mind. Yes. Like, what is it that makes the Persians different from the Greeks? Mm -hmm. what's, what's, what's the problem here? What's the world view, right? And this is what Carlo Levi was, was doing That's the same. Right. Like, what is fascism? What really, what is that state of mind? What does it have to assume to, to run everything else? And what happens when two different cultures, which have two <coughs> entirely different states of mind, come together? What, and and what, how could we rectify that? These are, these are the... I would love to get back into that book, but man, has anybody else tried to tackle it after Pierre recommended it? I didn't. I wasn't part of that conversation. And I, the only other thing I remember you were, you were mentioning was Pierre that it was written so 
metaphorically or allegorically that it captured it yeah. did a, a brilliant job of capturing yeah. things but then you have to do that work to bring yourself yeah. to these allegories or metaphors yourself which is perhaps why it was just you know for me it's all true what he said or what I just said both you know I'll just make the one reason I find found Smythe so fascinating in that whole genre of that whole period of time is they were apparently born before that horrible thing the English department calls reading a book where you know anything you write about a book as long as it's original or a play or a poem it's like your take on it and it has some validity because of that whereas his analyses and your work is always based on a very precise grasp of the thing of the play or whatever and understanding I mean he plays it like a he plays the Persians or the dramas like they are a composition. He has an awareness of it, which I, in my whole education, and I was a comparative literature major and did a, a lot of English literature and a lot of American literature, and I got nothing but crap from them. I would absolutely snore time, sleeping, because they never demonstrated an understanding of what it was we were looking at. So, I, I anyway, I think that's why I find, and I don't know whether that, that insidious mindset of everyone has a right to their own opinion, things are to me as they appear to me, and to you as they appear to you, right, blah, 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 that that is, that when did that come in, Pierre? Because it doesn't appear that he's got it, you know, so I find it like, That's it's right. like, wow, there are people <coughs> who didn't do this. That's right. When did he write? I think something like 1912 or something was when this yeah. book was written. Mm -hmm. So... I think it started in 1913. That's a joke, right? Sort of. <laughs> well, because something happened in 1913. Otherwise, it is a joke. Yeah. I just mean, I'm asking, like, when that... Do you I don't know. That was an interesting time. I mean, I'm thinking, like, the war on drugs started in about 19... That whole thing came down in about 1913. No. Oh, it didn't? Fifteen? With How the Rockefeller? Cocaine was 1932. Yeah. yeah, but there was an earlier one that I just saw a whole documentary about with, um, that was back, um, uh, who was it? Uh, the, 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 there was another one. See, when they made alcohol legal again, yeah. they okay. had a problem. And that is, they had this whole police force trained. Mm -hmm. Many, many men, right, gained great reputations and, and wealth on the side of the law. Oh. And now suddenly, it's no longer illegal. So therefore, they put on the list of things, new things that are going to be considered illegal. And the major thing they put on was marijuana. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, no. I'm thinking of something. Else. There were big. I was a big drug war, like in 18. But going back to 76. Uh, Carlo Levi stuff. Yeah. What is it you want to know about it? Yeah. It, it's a question. How can you recommend something that <laughs> I found impossible <laughs> to comprehend after going only eight pages? Or do you want to know what is the cause of fascism? What's the difference that brings it about? Because that's what I'd like to know. Yeah, I, I think that's where it goes more because, and, and I wanted to mention something else. Um, you know, I listen to KPFK a lot, and uh, they're struggling. They're not philosophers. They don't have the background. Um, and they're, they're like knocking on the door all the time. They're asking the questions. You can see them. They're like, what is the, right, what is the cause of this? But they have no philosophical background. They have no, so... They can't use the word, except maybe once a day, but it really needs to be used every five minutes, which is fascism or tyranny. That's what we're really looking at, and they can't get there. But <clears throat> I'm thinking to myself, someone needs to write a book. What the fuck is fascism? What the shit is it? Because that's what Americans need to be looking at right now, because we're staring in the face of it, right? Right. And, like, what drives it? And, and, you know, if it's the fifth hypothesis, uh, go there. Great, super. But someone has got to tackle this, like, 
right between the eyes because that's a, what America's getting right now. There was a guy. And one of the things that they mentioned on, on the last show that I heard driving up driving up to the Bassant Thursday around 4 o'clock, they're talking about, I didn't know this, but the guy who heads ISIS talking, this goes back to this, the first um, topic that we were on, which was belief and, and, and evidence in the face of belief and uh, what rhetoric has to do to, with the evidence. I didn't know this, but maybe you guys, David watches the news a lot. This guy who heads ISIS, Baba Dab or some kind of name like that. <clears throat> Sounds real close. The, apparently he was at Abu Ghraib. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, really, right? I went, oh, turn up, right? What's going on? Now, we only got a tiny sliver of what really happened at Abu Ghraib, all the abuses going on. And, and the people that let some of those photos out themselves, you know, were attacked and punished, right? But apparently there was a universe of crap going on in that, in that jail. And they detail it a little bit on this program on KPFK. And the guys, and I'll tell you in a second what that is, but the guy's main point is we need to get back to facts, evidence, open some of this stuff up and use our minds. You, that's what he's saying is let's look at this using our minds. He goes, not, not the rhetoric that you're hearing. And his example was, he says, this guy from ISIS um, was at Abu Ghraib. And some of the things that they were doing that has not really come out is they were raping children in front of their parents or the parents would be right at a cell next door and hearing the screaming coming out of these kids okay right out and and up and and about this guy babadab or however you say his name was there would this you know win hearts and minds for america right could you see an isis coming out of this I mean, these people that we call Americans, we knew nothing other than before, other than the fact that they drive around large vehicles and watch television sets. They come over to our land, and what are they doing to us? They're throwing us all in jail, raping our kids, and God knows what else in this prison. And of course ISIS is going to come out of that. But he says, but Americans don't know that that's, they don't connect all our abuses. And at that time, it was all Bush and, and Cheney and pushing for torture, right? This is what torture results in. But the connection between our torturing and ISIS is not made in America because these facts have been excised from public view. And for me, this is why I want, I want us to look straight in the eye of what fascism is because that's what at least what it does. And then it cleans up after itself by not telling the story. But that's only how it functions. What causes a person to say torture must be used, is used, will be used? What, what, what are the fundamental, what do you have to think about the world and about the universe and about the one or self, right? That, yes, but that's in the face of the evidence that it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that it has was a... Not, it is not a new fact discovered through this event, it was known for hundreds of years <clears throat> that torture does not reproduce reliable information, period. That goes yeah, all they, the way back to the Inquisition. But they can keep going in the face of that fact. They don't believe that. Oh no, it definitely does. Oh sure, torture is, yeah, that's why we're doing it. You know, you wouldn't believe the number of events that we've prevented on American soil because of the torture. We just can't tell you what they are, you know, for state secrets and all that. They don't believe that. They believe exactly the opposite. What preserves that belief? Is that the hope? In the face of that evidence that you... Hope really sounds like in the face of evidence to the contrary, we'll continue mm -hmm. on our course. It kind of goes back to that hope discussion. Mm -hmm. but, there exactly. may be, but there may be something else that I'm missing. Exactly. Kind of, kind of no. hesitated to offer that. But that's Moby what Dick. I think is. I guess Moby Dick. Isn't it? Isn't it stuff like said Moby Dick. Carlo Levi and Aeschylus? Sounds mm -hmm. like we ought to make a new a new Aeschylus a movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what Americans need to see on a grand scale. We, you know. How would you yeah. milk that out of Moby Dick and put it put it to the people? Well, the Captain Ahab. Uh, he has to persuade his crew to go against everything that they know is true. Mm. That's true. 
and it's only until he finally converts them to his view that the real drama unfolds. Mm. That's fascism. Yeah. Why is it that every fascist movement, whether it's Russian or American, is always against independent thinkers, whoever they are? Yeah. The gulags, the concentration camps, the United States, same thing. Independent thinkers are their first target. They can't stand freedom. There you go. Freedom to them is is, is fearsome, mm. frightening. Is that the same freedom that my sister sees when her when her her adopted son is painting on the wall in yes. his bedroom? Sure. Did you see that that guy in Washington assigned an aide to every cabinet to report to him who's disagreeing with him? Uh-oh. Time to go. Hey! Hey! Close. Okay. We have a tax appointment, I just found out, so I gotta oh. leave. So do I. It's on Monday, but I'd so like to be ready. For tomorrow, Gina? I'm done. It's the Thank you, of Gina. Thank you very much. Thank you guys, fun. Thank you, Pierre. Oh. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you, Pierre. Yeah. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you, Pierre. Fun talk, Julie. Yeah. This is for April. Oh. Get ahead of you, you mean March? Uh, I already did March. I thought the last one was, oh, was February. No. What would you think? I, 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 I took a hiatus. Oh, okay. Now I can afford to do it again. Thank you. OK, thank, thank you, Pierre. Thank, thank you. Fun. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure. Uh, Thank you, Regina. Oh, welcome. Yeah. Did that happen? No. Perfect time. It was our good fortune. Oh, Thank you, Pierre. Good talk, huh? Yeah.